Welcome to another session of our Squish Days conference. My name is Harry Portner. I'm one of the founders of FrogLogic and I'm here to talk about our code coverage tool Coco. So the topic of the talk is why Coco is how it is and you can maybe already guess that this is more about the underlying architecture of the tool. So this is not an intro on how to use the tool. I rather want to show you how it works and uh, why it works um, this way. We'll um, look at the main tool coverage scanner. Uh, we'll cover the question uh, what about header files which are a bit special when it comes to code coverage. Um, we'll talk about the measurements and how they are made in the end. I'll sum up uh, the main principles that we have seen. And the main questions as an introduction I've listed here are why must Coco be integrated into the compilation process? Following that is the question what does actually happen when the uh, tool is uh, part of your compilation process and then I will uh, the address the questions what about those two files CSMES and CSEXE that you will be seeing when using Coco. Now I'll start with the main principles that uh, uh, dominate uh, the whole design and these are that Coco is working on the source code of your application and unlike other tools that may try to get the information out of the binary we promise you that it really sees every detail of your application and um, in a very precise manner. This way we are also independent of what the compiler is producing because we are sitting in front of the compiler so that gives you some flexibility also in terms of the platforms that you're targeting. And uh, the instrumentation process that is happening in a very rough manner is about inserting statements into the source code and uh, when those statements are later hit during the execution of the code some counters are increased but we'll look at how that is actually looking like in a bit. And um, the second design principle that is uh, important to know about is that we always wanted to tool to also work on rather low-end hardware. So it was about uh, keeping memory consumption low and uh, possibly also work without a file seeing system being present on the target system. I'm using a very simple function foo here and you see a variable, you see a loop, some conditions and also uh, breaks and um, how does the tool even measure how much of that is being hit. What Coco does is to insert some new statements. You'll see them here in a blue color and uh, those statements will increase some counter value. In reality this is a bit more sophisticated uh, to uh, keep the memory impact low and also be thread safe but you can uh, roughly get the idea behind this. And you may actually also wonder why aren't those blue statements showing up everywhere? Shouldn't there be one after the variable and after each expression in there? But no, this is actually not needed to save some space. Um, we insert those instrumentation points only in strategically important uh, points. And for example, looking at the counter four, um, this uh, will show that the end of the function is reached. And if the execution reaches the end of the function, we know that um, other statements in the path leading there are also being executed. So this uh, helps to reduce the, uh, the size of the executable and improve the performance. Now the, the tool that will help you with all of this is called Coverage Scanner. And Coverage Scanner is being used on the source code file, so the CPP files and each source file is being read in and then this instrumentation that I talked about before is being applied. Here we see an if statement being um, instrumented and it's actually not the statement itself that is of interest here, it's the expression condition that is found in the if statement and the a less than b expression is instrumented by using the c, c++ ternary operator to find out uh, whether it has been true and false. And note it's very important not to uh, modify the behavior of the application that is being instrumented. So take uh, care has been taken here to also return uh, Boolean values true and false 
in the way that uh, the original application would have had them. And after this instrumentation, then uh, the source code is compiled as it would be in a normal way. And this tool cover scanner is sitting on front of the, your real compiler, but it is still making use of the real compiler, so it's not replacing that. And that's important because your source code may be subject to compiler flags being passed on the command line. There may be, if, if the uh, preprocessor directives in your code, there may be macros that are expanded and uh, the cover scanner tool is supposed to do the real thing. So it is actually making use of the compiler and the preprocessor um, to um, determine all the expansions of those macros. But this is now the reason why uh, the instrumentation is really happen happening at compile time. So it is not a static analysis that can be done on the source code up front. As without that logic, you may not even be discovering um, dead code found in your application that is disabled by some switches. How is that done? Um, we'll see a case of the GNU compiler, GCC or G++, that's shown on the right. It is installed in some standard path and uh, one approach consists of manipulating the your build proce process in a way that instead of the original uh, compilers, the Cocoa wrappers are being called. And you see those wrappers on the left hand side, they have CS standing for cover scanner prefixed uh, before the real compiler. So CS, GCC, or CS, uh, G. And with that setup, you would change your make file or whatever input you have and um, replace the original compiler name with those coverage scanner wrappers. And the wrapper will act as if it is the real compiler, so an emulation takes place. And um, you may also use a trick where we have a tool called G++ or GCC in some special directory uh, that really looks like the real compiler. So in that case, you would just change the path variable to point to that directory and you wouldn't even have to modify your build system. So that's the most convenient usage there is. And what the coverage scanner tool does in the back end then is to use the C, C++ preprocessor of your tool chain, let it um, go through the code, expand it, then coverage scanner will parse the code, look for functions, uh, if statements, whiles, and so on, uh, add the instrumentation statements, and then pass on the code to the real compiler. And the summary of that can be seen at the bottom. So the chain from the original source code, the preprocessing with the dash E option, then the instrumentation done by coverage scanner. The result is uh, saved in a temporary file and that temporary file is passed to the original compiler that will then generate the object file out of it. So from the outside there is no difference, but inside you will have an instrumented binary. We have just been talking about um, the main source files though. Uh, what about the header files? They may also be of interest as they can contain inline code, um, C++ templates, and you certainly would also want to know uh, whether the code in there is covered or not. Coverage scanner will still be restricted to only read the CPP files, but the headers are of course being included by the CPP files. And uh, the tool can see all of that by preprocessing the input that it receives, so the include statements found in the CPP files. This may happen from several places, so a header file may be included in different CPP files, and we see that in the diagram at the bottom, and the expanded uh, header file may end up in uh, multiple of those CSMES files. Those are the outputs of coverage scanner for a single source code file. So we'll have multiple copies, and uh, in the end when the linking happens of the object files, coverage scanner will see those duplicates and reduce them to a single one. So you'll have a single coverage analysis of the inline code. 
This is only true if the expansion really happened in the same way. See that example here of a log macro that is expanding to a printf statement for debug builds and to nothing for a release build. If you use that macro all over your project and um, keep the debug builds to only part of that um, project, you'll end up with the header files being pre-processed in different ways and the instrumentation will also happen in different ways. And uh, this is just a simple statement, but imagine there are also some if statements or other uh, complex uh, uh, pieces of a control flow in your application. The coverage cannot be that easily merged and that's why Coverage Scanner will produce enumerated versions of the header files and you'll later be mandated to um, reach coverage for all of those versions individually. There is now one corner case that I just want to warn you of, although um, it is uh, rarely happen happening in reality and that is the potential of losing header files if you do the instrumentation wrongly. And this assumes a scenario where the code in a header file is uh, purely being called from your text executable. So it's not invoked somewhere from your main code base, but the text executable is having the only call in there. And if you restrict the instrumentation to the um, tested software and not just and not also to the test software, you may uh, not have the instrumentation of the header file happening. And that's why we recommend to instrument your whole source code base, so pipe everything through the coverage scanner utility, but exclude the files that you are not interested in seeing their coverage of through one of the exclude switches, like the one that we see at the bottom uh, masking um, out that file uh, based on its absolute path uh, using wildcard characters. Now the measurements uh, that happen in the end uh, will be a combination of all of this. We'll have a, a set of CSMES files um, generated for all object files and once the application is run the, the counters will be increased. That is the measurement and that measurement is then saved in a CSEXE file for each execution. And that file is kept absolutely minimal. As I said, one of the goals is to keep the memory usage really low for embedded systems and also for performance reasons. We can look at that uh, file uh, just for the fun of it and we'll see a header that uh, lists first the number of counters in the file, a checksum to protect against version mismatches and the file path that we're talking about. And the following lines then will contain the counter values. To keep that really small, um, the no hit or one hit case are abbreviated to zero or one and uh, all the other numbers are being encoded. That is really just the, uh, the execution information, all the information about the source code and the, the um, control flow branches found in it, they are kept in the CSMS file that is remaining on your PC. So. Um, we can even make use of that by not putting that data into file. We can transmit it over a serial port or any other network connection, um, even customize the output in a way that you keep everything in memory uh, of your device and later use a debugger to fetch the data from the target system. And um, you'll put those two things together later by importing the execution data into the CSMES file. We'll call that a coverage database, although it's a simple file, but um, the, this kind of database architecture still makes sense as an intermediate format, as we'll have all the separate test information still stored as separate entities in the database. So the tool is not generating a report right away to allow for all kinds of analysis. But the import that I mentioned um, is uh, being documented here through the command line tool that exists. Um, and that's just an alternative to the way to do it through the coverage browser GUI interface. Um, you may want to use the command line tool, though, if you want to automate all of the coverage gathering 
uh, as part of your CI system. And we see the import utility uh, takes the CSMES database file name as the first argument. The second argument is the name or title of the test. Uh, then there is an option to specify a policy. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then one or multiple CSEXE file. So if you have run uh, 100 tests on different machines, you will have 100 of those files and you can all import them into the CSMS database file in one go. But I um, promise to talk a bit about the policy and you see some uh, naming of duplicates and merging here. And uh, this gives you flexibility in case you want to um, drop duplicate uh, test runs right away or do you want to keep them separate? What about test runs that didn't lead to any coverage at all? That can be uh, controlled through the import policy. But uh, I see we have already reached the end of the talk, um, summing up that uh, tool uh, Coco is heavily based on operating on the source code. Um, this she gives you quite some power as um, you will see the source code the way the developer wrote it and not as a uh, compiler may have later processed that and possibly optimized parts of it away. The preprocessor is used to give you the real information about the project you're uh, building. So it's not just a static view on it um, that uh, lacks the configuration of your real uh, product. And uh, the runtime aspect uh, was about the CSEXE files that are generated and uh, they are being imported into the CSMES database. Out of this, you'll later be able to generate reports in HTML format, CSV, Excel, and text. You'll be able to compare the tests against each other, rank them by their uh, coverage, analyze source code patches, and so on. But I think this will have to be part of another talk. Thank you.